I'm going to start the clock now. <laughs> this is the other timer. Okay. <laughs> if you're lucky, you should use it now. <laughs> I'm Andrew, and I'm an alcoholic. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my dif difficulties, that victory over them may help, I uh, can't remember, may help those bear witness to those I would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. So one of the things I did um, once upon a time years ago, I was speaking at the, uh, What's the group that closed uh, the speakers Saturday speakers group in Tacoma? I was asked. I was well along down the road. You know, I've been down the road. Look at me, my God! Um, <laughs> I, sh I should start by saying that my sobriety date is January fifth. So I didn't meet you then. Uh, January the fifth, two thousand one, and uh, uh, I have a sponsor. I have a service sponsor. I work with others. And uh, it's an amazing experience. But to get back to this real quickly, to this, this meeting, I thought I wanted to make myself vulnerable to the people in the room. And so I, I sang the verse of uh, uh, Amazing Grace. And then similar to this prayer, I started to break down. And I said to them, <clears throat> I said, I wanted to make myself vulnerable to you. And I think it worked too well. <laughs> so that was, that's where I am. Um, <clears throat> my, I was born in 1959 in Tacoma, Washington, have been mostly a lifelong resident. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. Um, my mother uh, sort of isolated from him. Uh, as time went on. And um, I always felt like, what is this square peg in a round hole? Didn't, just didn't feel like I fit in. How many times have we heard that? And, you know, I would tend to be just slightly neurotic. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, um, you know, I was just a real um, sensitive child. And then as I grew older and I went through school, I, I also recognized that, um, and was frightened to death by it, that I was gay. It caused a lot of um, heartache inside my soul because I didn't even tell anybody that I was gay until I was 23 years old. And so I carried that around. But my father, by that point, didn't really like me. Not before, well, he was already dead when I was 23. But to, the reality is, is that from probably, I don't know, maybe 13, 14, I don't think that he felt that I, that I was his son. I don't know. At any rate, we never talked about that. But I could just feel the um, animosity. I did, and this is before AA, I, did, I was gifted the opportunity, I didn't see it that way at the time, to take care of my father when he was dying of uh, spinal cancer. And uh, why am I so emotional? Hmm. Anyway, it, it's, this is a big deal to me. So at any rate, um, I went through school, so bottled up, <coughs> very lonely, and didn't know how to reach out. And then I tried acting straight, and that didn't, that didn't work so well. <laughs> so I thought, um, and this isn't the only reason that I joined, but um, I did have, I had a religious fervor. You know, we grew up in a very strict Catholic family. And at a given point, I joined a, a Benedictine community. A monk. I became a monk. 
and I was there for 13 years. <clears throat> and uh, in that time, I had experiences with alcohol, including one when I was away at seminary. Uh, <laughs> one of the monks at that particular house took me down to show, you know, to uh, offer me some margaritas. Well, that, it was probably the one and only time in my drinking career that I had fish eyes. I mean, the whole room just kept going out, going out. <laughs> and I had a friend who kind of, once he knew what the trouble was, grabbed me by the arm and hauled me upstairs, put me to bed. And then even in my own community, I had similar experiences. And one of the monks one day said to me, as we were walking, he stopped me. He said, Andrew, I have relatives who are like you. You need to be careful. And there's always been this little thing inside of me that was sort of like a rebel. So it was, I didn't say this to him, but I lived this. It was sort of like the big F you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. <clears throat> and that included when I left the monastery, I was totally unopen to anybody talking to me. You know, why? Why do you want to leave? Would you consider staying? This one guy tried for four hours, and I was just like, no. I've made up my mind, and I was gone. And so taking all my skills with my, my English degree, I went off and started bartending. <laughs> I went from the spiritual life to the spirit's life, <laughs> and I began perfecting my alcoholism. And uh, I was with a friend. We opened a now long-veiled restaurant. It was literally six months and a day, which was the average at that time. And uh, in February of uh, 1997, I too was out. Uh, well, I'd been in a bar, had had a bit to drink, and also, they closed the bar, and for the third time in my life, I got to try marijuana, because I thought I was a good guy, right? I would never do that. So, and so, as I was walking out the door, which was the last thing I remembered, it was sort of like I was walking into a mist. And then I tell people, and you have to believe me, this is true, I suddenly felt heat on the back of my neck. And I was at the corner of, uh, of uh, Mart Martin Way and Phone Ro Phones Road in Olympia. And the blue light was swirling. But I could feel that. So I put my head up, looked in the rearview mirror, and I said, well, this isn't going to be good. <laughs> and it wasn't. It wasn't. It, it began a huge, huge as anybody who's had a DUI, it, it was, it's a big emotional, well, certainly was for me, frightening, expensive experience. I felt like I was going down a rabbit hole. But let me assure you, I was not ready to give up yet. <laughs> that was to come four years later. <clears throat> I, um, <laughs> I went through all of that. And I went, I had to go to AA meetings, and I just hated you people. I, and, you know, and I told my lawyer, I said, Paul, I have to be able to drink. I'm a bar manager. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> logic, right? Mm -hmm. So I want, don't want to focus so much on the uh, problem, except to say that finally I arrived at a point one night, a friend of mine, I was working in a bar, uh, a gay bar at that. And I went, um, we were going to a play. A friend of mine, Bill, Bill, we were going to a play with his mom and sister and another friend of theirs. And so he and I both kind of did some pre-functioning. And then we went to the play. And then when it hit, you know, halftime, if you will, intermission, <laughs> We, we stood and had some wine because that seemed like a great idea. And then we went back to the, to the bar where I worked at, which is called the Silverstone in Tacoma, and sat down and proceeded to, you know, just kind of fill the corners. And uh, I'd gotten just enough 
of an experience with their family friend. She was really kind of a far out there evangelical Christian. And that, remember that thing about the big F you? And I proceeded to just tear into her. I went home and I was kind of in and out of a blackout. I went to bed and the next morning, as I was lying there, all of it came back to me like a, like a sledgehammer and the guilt, the shame, you know, the DOI didn't do it, the fear of that. But the idea that I, as I was lying there, I went, you don't even know who the hell you are. No idea. And I just couldn't imagine that I was that person, that it offended these people. And as I was, as I was lying there, as I've told people, I said, I never did like to work too hard at prayer. <laughs> and so as I was lying in bed, I did something that was earnest. And he said, God help me. I don't want to live like this anymore. So I stepped across the, the threshold. You folks invited me, you had before, but this time I went across that threshold and entered the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous through the Unity Destiny group. My home group would eventually become the vision group, which Stephen and Nancy would attend. And, uh, but at that first meeting, a guy named Brian M at the end of it, as I was heading to my car, because I was one of those people who, as soon as the meeting was over, was right to the car, uh, lest I get contaminated. <laughs> <laughs> and so so uh, he came up to me and he handed me, you know, uh, just a soft cover, big book, which he put his name and phone number in it and said, I want you to have this. I was really kind of uh, overwhelmed. And then I thought, well, I guess I have to come back now, don't I? So I did. And uh, I kept going. And then eventually um, I was going to the 12 and 12 to this uh, hall in Tacoma, right near where I was living. And uh, I was in there one day and this young man came in and he, was, he wasn't too bad. I was interested, you know, early sobriety. I thought, yeah, you're, you're kind of hot. And so I had spoken at the meeting, and this was a meeting where I can remember a guy sitting there one time, he's sitting there, just shaking, and so angry, he wanted to just start screaming, but didn't. But this guy walked up, and he's soft-spoken, he's a car salesman, and he said, my friend, I don't think you belong here. So he started taking me around to different groups, and that's how I ran into uh, uh, Jim R., who had, had been the uh, vision group was only a, not even quite a year old at that point. And then we, uh, I, I went to that meeting and I liked it so much that I just kept coming back. And then uh, I was talking to what turned out to be Jim's sponsor one evening after the meeting was over. And I said, this is about three months into Sobriety. I said, <clears throat> so when do you become worthy enough to have a sponsor? <laughs> and this guy, Mike, he says, just a second, I'll be right back. He walks out of the room. Uh, Jim was kind of in this larger room. He's, I hear this, and it's just like pissed me off. Hey, Jim, I've got another old one for you. <laughs> I was... 41 at the time, so it's a little hard to take. At any rate, this guy comes in, not a very tall guy, he had ponytail, and I thought, my God, who is this person? It's like, you know, the last of the hippies have arrived. And um, little did I know that he was the founder of some of the groups here in Seattle and had founded that group. And he came up to me and he asked me a few simple questions. Do you, do you want to be sober? Yeah, I want to be, you know, um, would you be willing to meet every week? Yeah, I'd do that. Could you call me every day for a year? He may not have said the year part. He said, could you call me every day? Yeah, I'll do that. Because I was still sick, sad, and sorry. And I wanted some freedom. 
Anyway, moving on, we went through the steps. We go up to this little room in the church, and it turned out it was like the kindergarten room, <laughs> and there were toys all over, <laughs> and little chairs, which for the life of God, I couldn't get out of now if I had to. But <clears throat> at that time, we'd sit in these little chairs, and Jim would say, we're in spiritual kindergarten. And it was true. Here I had been a monk for 13 years, and I was finally learning about God. As we went through that book, page after page, the first 164 phone calls, eighth step, ninth step. I remember, yeah, there was a lot of stuff inside of me that had to come out. And uh, he was marvelous. I, love, I just love Jim. And uh, I got to a point where I could begin to sponsor. And I, you know, it started moving out. And Jim had always been one for service. This is the other piece. You know, right from the beginning, he said, well, before we go up, let's make the coffee and put a few chairs out. Had little no, to no idea what these people are doing to you when you're in early sobriety. <laughs> but they had still this sense of service. And so uh, I, I, became, I became invested in the vision group. Uh, was initially the alt GSR very early. I had like 18 months sobriety. Three months into the position, the DCM calls me and says, are you Andrew? And I said, yes, I am. This is Marge. And I said, oh, hi, Marge. How are you? Hey, are you guys still interested in being part of um, the district? And I said, yes. I said, we, we have a GSR. Well, he hasn't been here in three months, Andrew. So suddenly I was in that position. And I got to meet more of you. And I learned, like at an assembly, it's really mind-bending. Your first assembly, we had, I don't know, 15, 16 motions to go through. It went late and it was contentious. And then, and I didn't want to go back for this spiritual breakfast. And then I did. And it opened my heart up about the idea of why we do service, why we're there for each other. And I called Jim, and I was emotional. I guess I'm an emotional guy. Have you figured that out? <laughs> At any rate, um, we talked about that. <clears throat> and my life just kept expanding. When my mother died in 2009, Jim said he would be at the funeral, and then he didn't show. I was later to discover that he'd had his own problems. And uh, for about a year and a half, I wandered in the wilderness without a sponsor. And I ran into a guy one day who had changed my life. Uh, Bill C., wonderful. He was a former priest of the Archdiocese of Seattle. And we... <laughs> We struck up this connection. I had been looking for a sponsor by this point. And as we were talking one night, I just looked at him and I said, oh my God, this is forest for the trees moment. I said, Bill, would you be my sponsor? Well, I haven't had any in a while. He says, sure, I'll do it. And we started meeting every week. We'd go to dinner. We'd talk. And Jim had showed me what all the black was on the page in the big book. And Bill helped me to realize that a slavish adherence to the, to the big book is great, but there's life outside of the black and white. There's life outside of that. I'm not going to get sober by controlling myself into sobriety. I had to also live all of that. And... Uh, Better check this thing keeps shutting off, but I still have time, <clears throat> unfortunately for you. <laughs> At any rate, um, we we went on these journeys, and one of the things we'd do after dinner is go to Point Defiance Park. And we'd drive around on five mile drive, and we would talk about life. Jim was or Jim, uh, Bill was about seventy three years old, and. Uh, as the sun would begin to head toward fall. 
And we started getting to the end of our journey together after some years. I began to dread that time. Sorry. Thinking that he would not be here one day, which he's not. But I learned a lot from him. And one night we were at we were at a Naps restaurant. I don't know if anybody knows of that restaurant in Tacoma. Wonderful place. And we would go there lots of times. And somebody was interested in me. Imagine. And so I was trying to figure it out. Because you know, as a former monk, and by the way, Jim called me the drunk monk. <laughs> <laughs> can't go without mentioning that. <laughs> Called me the drunk mom. But anyway, back to Bill. We're sitting at a place is packed. And I'm telling him about this thing. And I said, well, it's probably this. That's what he's interested in. Or it's probably that. Feeling very insecure. Bill kicks back in his chair. And he just starts laughing. And I hope nobody will be offended. Kicks his chair back, starts laughing, goes, ha, 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 Andrew, it's none of your goddamn business what other people think of you. <clears throat> Anybody who's lived with an alcoholic parent <coughs> might understand that is just simply not true. I would have to fight for my at least emotional life every night that I was with that man my father. <clears throat> so uh, that was like this big opening up. I'm not responsible for all this. What a freeing experience. It's taken years to really take that in. I also have a friend who lives up here. I don't get to see him very often. Uh, he always goes by Michael Sweeney. Some of you may know him or may not. At any rate, uh, I was getting butt hurt about something uh, regarding a retreat I was involved in. And he finally said to me, this was the other big moment for me. He said, Andrew, you've been doing this for a while. Put your hand out and create the community you crave. And that's kind of led directly to where I am today, which is, you know, I've, uh, I've gotten <laughs> more and more involved in service. I was the GSR for the uh, vision group, a uh, vision group, but then I became the GSR for Unity Destiny because I'd moved back to it and made it my home group. And uh, while I was sitting at the first meeting, I was the alt GSR again. And uh, <laughs> as I'm sitting there, so they were looking for a, a central service representative for District 9. And I thought, well, if I have to be at this damn meeting, I might as well do something useful. <laughs> it's a business meeting, right? So, um, so then, sure. That was, it was really an amazing experience. Not always easy because we were moving into kind of a, well, I guess it's fair to say tumultuous time in that, in that entity. And uh, I'd learned enough that I needed to remain calm and that it was important that there had to be some kind of adult in the room, even if I was going to not do that very well. But I did, I, I actually did, because you guys taught me that stuff, how to be an adult. Following that, how much time do I have left? Because it keeps going away. Well, six, six, okay. Following that, <clears throat> um, somebody came to me and asked me if I would consider becoming the Alt-DCM for District 9. <clears throat> so I was at the meeting. Uh, the Because the, I'd been there as a, you know, a, a GSR. And I'm sitting there and they start going around the room, are you available? Are you available? And I'd talk to everybody. And then I sat there, I said, uh, they asked me if I was available and I was very nervous. I didn't know what I was getting into. And I said, well, I guess so. And the guy thought I'd said no. And so he said, well, and he said no. And so he said, no, he said yes. And I said, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just nerves. A great experience with a guy named Scott B, who was the DCM. And uh, I learned so much from him about service. 
the idea of giving. And there's the idea of sacrifice. And I learned that in being freed from my alcoholism, I had to give back, even though at times that would be difficult and that my time was taken up. And I got a great service sponsor. And um, the only problem was he went and died on me after I became DCM, about four months, Michael W. And uh, I was really crushed. Do you know that these people in Alcoholics Anonymous walked with me through that? I don't know why, but I ended up loving that man so much that when he left, there was a hole in my heart. And, uh, but everybody was so supportive. And we had, a, we had a celebration of Michael's life online because by then it was freaking COVID, right? And since then we've been learning how to come out of that again. And the idea, you know, that it's great to be online. I'm glad we have that. But we need people. We need people with their butts in chairs talking to other people, telling their stories as well, taking them out for coffee, lunch, whatever, and sharing the idea of hope. That's our goal. We can give them hope. Um, I, I truly, uh, it's been an amazing journey so far. My, uh, my family, I'd always been kind of, after I entered the monastery, I was always distant from them. Because, you know, when I drank, when I was working at the bar, I would, uh, I would end up uh, coming in. Like, my big picture was watching the family, the young nephews and nieces leaving to go to midnight mass, and I was coming in drunk. So then I had to build a new relationship with them. One other thing I'd like to, to mention, after I had been gone from uh, monastic life for 13 years, I got a call one day, I was setting up the bar, and my good friend who is now deceased, Father Alfred, he said to me, uh, Andrew, do you have some time to go to lunch? Uh, I'm thinking the 21st of March, which happens to be St. Benedict's feast day. And I thought about it. I said, sure, I'm off that day. Let's go. And I went down there after we finished lunch. We're sitting in my car. And he says, I don't know how to tell you this. And I'm thinking he's telling me he's dying. Mm -hmm. And he's really sick, which it turned out he was really sick. But <laughs> before I could get to that, or he could get to that, he turned to me and he says, I don't know how to, to ask this. So I'm just going to ask, would you, be, would you consider becoming the treasurer for the community? And I was looking out the window, preparing for bad news. And I just whipped my hand around and said, what? <laughs> I was an English major, did I tell you that? <laughs> Math was not my strong suit. I've been there now over 13 years. The biggest change in my life. It gave me an opportunity to renew my experiences with singing in a, with people that I love and to be able to do living amends to change the story. That's what this stuff is all about. Healing the past where possible and having a life that is possible. Now, I don't no longer feel like a square peg in a round hole. And I have you folks to thank for that. We can never forget that we can be something special when we hand on this spiritual toolkit. By the way, always use every tool you can get your hand on. If you need a psychologist or whatever, do it. Do it. I'm still unfolding just like we all are. I can never thank you enough. And thank you for allowing me to be vulnerable with you tonight. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.